What do all these have in common? You're in the right direction. These are all items, this long list, being disrupted by, by smartphones. At this point in the presentation, I had planned to lift up my smartphone, and I've misplaced it. <laughs> so uh, I've been on without my phone for 15 minutes now. I'm OK. <laughs> Keep an eye on me, please. Uh, and if any of you find a Motorola Droid Razor smartphone line somewhere, it's probably Vince's. The rules are changing in healthcare. There have been a set of rules that we have learned about how business operates in a digital world, and healthcare will need to be operating in these rules. I'm here this morning to share with you what some of the new rules are and to give you some early perspectives on how you can apply them for better care of your patients and competitive advantage for your business. So if you're here to uh, understand how to protect the status quo, and this is not really a concern for this conference, but uh, in some of the audiences I speak to, it may be, uh, you're in the wrong presentation. This is really about recognizing that healthcare is ripe for disruption, and that disruption is good, that there will be many opportunities. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about my, my personal point of view, if I may, my background and how I got here and how I got to this perspective. So I've been in healthcare for over 30 years. Uh, my first 15 years were in the hospital world and uh, got to see virtually all parts of the hospital, could see that there were tremendous capabilities there, but they weren't glued together very well. Then for the last 15 years, I've been running my own consulting company. World headquarters of my company are located in Boise, Idaho, second floor of my house. And I've had a wonderful chance to work with just about every sector of healthcare, with uh, medical device, information technology, disease management, home health care, hospitals, doctors, uh, a lot of startup technology companies. Uh, a lot of consumer technology companies. And so the perspective that I'm bringing for you is not unique to one sector. It's really looking across all of these different sectors. The, uh, the wave of digital disruption is about to hit. Uh, I hope to give you some previews of it. And uh, I think we've got a fair amount of time, so I'll pause here and there for some questions as well. Let's go a little bit deeper into the smartphone world and see the magnitude of disruption that has occurred. Go back to the year 2005 and look at who was in the game and the relative market share. Hewlett Packard with their Palm Pilot, uh, Symbian, uh, Nokia, uh, Windows, and Blackberry. And then if you look there's just an early emergence here, iOS, the Apple in 2007. And this little green, let's see what this little green is. So the way this market has changed, it has turned literally inside out in six years. And the uh, Apple iOS, the operating system, and the Android operating system, which works on multiple phones, now have 78% market share. What a different world. So people ask me, or they sometimes will point out, what does this have to do with health care? Uh, so I thought about that a little bit, and I've got a list. It's a list of a dozen items. Uh, I'm going to have to read these to you because I can't memorize a dozen of them. But I think it begins to signal some of the possibilities for the world of healthcare. So number one is the magnitude 
of the disruption. Inside out. Number two, the speed of the disruption that's occurred. Six years, and industry giants and incumbents, Nokia, Microsoft, BlackBerry, Palm Pilot, no longer on the radar screen to any significant extent. There is still a race for number three, uh, probably among uh, Windows, perhaps BlackBerry, although their market declined another, another 25%, I read about a week ago. Uh, it may turn out that HTML5 really becomes the number three. The initial denial of disruption. Uh, people say healthcare is really going to be immune, and I will say through my 30 years of experience, that's probably been pretty immune. But I feel very optimistic. This time, it's really on the cusp. The limited number of platforms, and I think it raises the question, how many platforms are we going to have in healthcare? The answer probably uh, is very unlikely to be a sustainable 400 electronic health records. Uh, my guess is it's probably going to shake out and stabilize at around 6 to 10, more than what we see in smartphones. But uh, the lesson, certainly from telecom, is uh, there's only a certain number that the industry can support. Number five is the power of indirect network effects. I'm going to come back and define that a little bit later on. The power is largely in the nearly one million apps that Apple has. That's where you say, I want this phone because I can do so many things with it. We're just, again, on the cusp of that with healthcare. Uh, six, how many different sectors get disrupted? You saw that whole list. Uh, smartphones uh, disrupted a long list. The disruption comes out of left field. Uh, most of those on the list were nowhere being targeted by Apple or by Android for that disruption. Number eight, there is more than one route to success. Uh, Apple, iOS, and Android have very different philosophies. Uh, what they do have in common in terms of being open is that they're open to developers, API is open. But beyond that, Apple's very close. It's a walled garden. They manage it extremely tightly. Android is open source, uh, still not entirely open, but certainly far more open. There's not just one way to succeed. Uh, technology is an enabler, but the business model has to follow. There are clear winners and losers. Uh, that may be hard to hear, but I think it's something that we need to anticipate. Uh, a user preference for single platforms or single homing. Uh, I don't know many people who own both a Android smartphone and a Apple iPhone. You tend to pick one or the other. And then finally, the fact that uh, network effects aren't necessarily uh, permanent or that the role that they've achieved uh, isn't necessarily going to last. And if you look where Apple is starting to really lose, it's in the handset market. So that's some of the lessons. Uh, an overview of today. Uh, the, the title of my presentation is Replatforming Healthcare. Healthcare has been built on a physical platform around doctor's offices and hospitals and we would go to a centralized location. Uh, when President Dwight Eisenhower had his heart attack in 1955, right here in Denver, uh, he was taken to Fitzsimmons Army Hospital where he spent the next seven weeks. Today, if you have a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, you're gonna be out in three or four days. And yet, there's still this long recovery period, and it needs to be managed virtually through technology, through phone, fax, occasional visits. It's really being replatformed. Healthcare is being replatformed on a digital and virtual world. So I'm writing a book. This book has become the mission of my life, and uh, 
the theme is going to be around rules for disruption in healthcare. Here's the entire list. Uh, I'd say the book's probably about 80% outlined and researched, and I'm planning to go up to our family mountain cabin and crank it out in the next few months. Uh, and today I'm going to talk only about two of these areas. They're areas that are critical to understanding the success of many companies outside of healthcare over the last 10 to 15 years, but in my view, really have not yet gotten the deserved level of attention that they will need to be getting. So this is a preview. It's not the whole thing. I'll be talking about networks and network effects, and then a term, strategic openness, or the idea of being open for competitive advantage. How do you use openness for competitive advantage? So uh, that's, that's a little bit of an overview. We're only going to cover really two topics today. Networks and network effects. The, uh, the, you know, we know we're, we're, that the industrial age is fading. And the term that is often used to say to describe what's replacing the industrial age, I've heard a lot of terms. Commonly, it's the information economy or the digital economy. Uh, personally, I like the term coined by Seth Godin, which he calls the connection economy. And that it really goes to more the ends of what we're trying to do and what this new economy is about. We are trying to make connections digital connections through the technology, but ultimately personal connections through the people. And this comes out in the form of better coordination of care. I'll come back to this in my closing. Okay, uh, how many of you have heard the term network effects? Okay, uh, I think my sense is that uh, I'm going to present to you what is a 20th century view of network effects. It's not inaccurate, but it's, it's not deep enough. This is a picture from Wikipedia. And the example that is usually given is either the telephone or the fax machine. And as the example is played out, it's basically you can't do anything with one phone or one fax machine. You have two of them. You can connect two people. Uh, and as you connect more and more people, uh, the law from the 80s was Metcalfe's law of the value of the network grows with the square of the growth of the user base, or it grows exponentially. Okay, so that's so far so good. So here's the beware part of it, where Metcalfe's law in the last five, eight, ten years has largely been uh, at very much, at the very least, questioned and some people would just say discredited. The value of users on the network is not equal to you. Think about your Facebook connections and who you really value. Do you value the 50, 200? If you're a prolific connector, maybe you've got 2,000 connections. There's a billion people. You value the people that you are already connected with or the ones that you potentially might be connecting with. Uh, this is a, a, a graphical representation of what, face, what Facebook's uh, market adoption has been, and it illustrates the idea of uh, probably one of the most dominant companies that has achieved and acquired and really is learning to master this notion of network effects. What I want to point out to you, there's three phases. There is this early phase where growth occurs relatively slowly. Uh, there's a tipping point that is reached where the network effects truly kick in. Think about it, and here the fax machine example is actually fairly useful. When you start thinking in your own mind, you know, gee, all of my friends have a fax machine. If I don't have one, I'm going to be left out. I can't communicate with them. That's the point where you really begin to experience the network effects. And then you have the dramatic market growth that occurs 
in this phase. So where the economists uh, disagree is really on the slope of this curve, uh, kind of beyond the details of this. But some economists say that this curve is actually uh, much steeper, and others say it's more of a logarithmic curve and not a curve this way. But it's really the subset of the groups that you're trying to connect that drive the value of the network. You know, and the total number is far less relevant. So uh, what's a 20th first century perspective? I'm going to throw some terms at you. And I expect that there's going to be two levels of understanding here. Either one of them is fine with me. Uh, there will be a, a per small percentage of the audience who uh, I think will follow the technical aspects that I'm going to dive into. And I'll ask you to pay attention for the next five or eight minutes. Uh, and if you do, that's great. But uh, it's taken me five years. My first, the clients I tend to work with are very leading edge, bleeding edge companies. And this notion of platforms, network effects first came up with a client. I remember it well, 2007. Uh, Randy Williams, MD, the, uh, the CEO of Pharos Innovations. Uh, it's taken me five years really kind of to gel all this stuff. So I don't expect that you're going to get all the details. The takeaway is at one level, ideally, you'll understand it. But at another level, it's more of a recognition of there are things that we don't know. And hopefully, you'll be paying more attention as this gets more discussion over the next couple of years in healthcare. So. Uh, the examples of the fax machine, that's a single-sided network. There's only users who use fax machines or telephones. More typically in healthcare, there are going to be multi-sided platforms. Uh, you're already familiar with multi-sided platforms. Uh, ladies' night at the ballpark is an example of a multi-sided platform. Why do you give discounts to ladies? Because you're trying to get the men there at the ballpark. It's really a simple example. Uh, newspapers are an example of a multi-sided network. You're trying to draw in readers. You undercharge them. You charge more to the advertisers based upon the number of people that you've got actually reading your newspaper. In healthcare, uh, I'm going to share with you an example in a couple of minutes of a patient doctor portal. Two sides, multi-sided network. Then we need to discern the different kinds of network effects. And I'm going to walk through an example. There are direct network effects. Uh, as I told you, there are indirect network effects that come from the applications or the complements on the platform. And then network effects can be positive or they can be negative. Think of a highway network where it's built so that you can get from place to place. But at 5 p.m. in the evening in the city, it's congested. So you're not getting positive value. You're getting negative value from a congested network. There is potential for winner-take-all or winner-take-most type of marketplaces. You know, Facebook being the biggest example where the thought process that goes on in your head and anyone who wants to compete with Facebook would say, well, how do I get people off this network? And you would say, I don't want to try something else. All my friends are already on Facebook. So the lock-in, the switching costs are very, very high. And then finally, in caps, what I don't see being discussed is even if you begin to understand this phenomenon of networks and network effects, what do you do about it? And over the last 10 or 15 years, there's a lot of rules that we have learned. I'll go back to the Facebook example. Uh, if you remember that Facebook was launched at Harvard University, and as they rolled it out, they rolled it out in regional sub-networks of other universities, and there was competition with the company MySpace. Uh, and at one point, what uh, they figured out at Facebook was, we really got to put the pedal to the metal, and they put a great marketing thrust on capturing local regional universities. 
Again, you may ask, what does that have to do with health care? If you try to build a health care network at a national level, there's not a lot of connectivity there. If you try to build it around regional submarkets, around people who already know one another within a city or a private health information exchange, much better chance of actually achieving network effects. Okay, uh, an example. Uh, if you get the detail, great. If not, just please at least recognize that there's a lot here. We'll start with an electronic health record platform. And it's used by physicians. We add a patient portal. So now we have a multi-sided platform. And the question is, where are the network effects here? Okay, number one, so the, the thought process you got to go through is, would physicians value having other physicians on the network? And the answer to that, I'll offer my own answers. Some of these are ones you can actually disagree with. That's fine. You know, there's no ultimate answer. But the answer I would give is yes, because uh, I can share information with them. Uh, they can refer to me. I can refer to them. So physicians value having other physicians on the network. The next question, direct network effects, do patients value having other patients on the network? Uh, with some major exceptions, my answer to that is no. You know, you really don't care if you're a 45-year-old male who's relatively healthy, maybe has one chronic condition. You don't care how many other people are out there. You just want to get cared for. Let's talk about the other network effects, the uh, cross-platform. The question you have to ask here is, do physicians care about how many patients are on the network? And my answer to that is yes, because my workflow is one. I want to have work, one workflow. I'm not going to have five different platforms for five different workflows. The ideal situation for me would be having as many patients as I can of mine on the network. Subject to what I talked to earlier, this idea of congestion, of where I get too many patients and I can't deal with them. And do patients value having more doctors on the network? Well, yeah. And here again, you have to say, but I'm probably going to put a lot more value if they're already my doctors. I think about this experience with my mom, who's now 89 years old. And uh, I live in Boise, Idaho. We have uh, St. Luke's health system there, and they have a, an extensive medical record network. But some of my mom's doctors aren't on the network. A great headache. It's a great problem. Let's take this example. Oh, so let me, let me sum it up. So if you count the number of arrows here, it's way more complicated than the fax machine example. We're no longer at the stage of just one sort of broad on and off network effect, we're at the level of uh, potential for four different types of network effects. Now it even gets a little more complicated. Let's add a remote monitoring, a remote patient monitoring application to this platform and again go through the question of where are the network effects. I'm not going to go through them but I will illustrate the numbers. So you would ask the questions to all of these different folks. Do doctors value having this application? Do patients having this va value having this application? Do app vendors value having other app vendors? From the case of Apple and from the case of Google, we know the answer is yes. You know, you don't want to be developing on BlackBerry or on Nokia today because there aren't any other apps and you're afraid of those companies going belly up. So uh, at this point, we've now got the potential for nine different network effects. Uh, have you thought about them all? Are you aware of them? Okay. Does this bring back any memories from <laughs> earlier times in your life? That's kind of what this is like. It's a hunt for, for Waldo. Where are we seeing network effects in healthcare? 
Uh, many early examples, I will highlight a couple of them. The uh, biggest success or most visible success is e-prescribing. A fairly compartmentalized segment of healthcare uh, workflow and transactions where we've gone from about 4% of clinicians doing e-prescribing in 2008 to, I believe it's about 70% and close, I predict will be close to about 90% uh, within a couple of years. Again, a two-sided model where you've got to get the clinicians on the network and you've got to get the pharmacies on the network. And you've got, in this case, 95% of pharmacies that are participating. This has become deeply rooted. It's a great success. It's probably the closest thing that healthcare has to a Facebook model so far. But I think we're going to have a lot more. Uh, patients like me. So when I talked with you about the earlier example of do patients value having other patients, with a couple of exceptions, my answer was no. Here's one of those exceptions. If you are someone with a rare and life-changing disease where the science is not very clear, and that's exactly the patient audience that patients like me is trying to connect, they're essentially a, uh, if you're not familiar with them, you have a rare condition, you go, you sign up, it's like a, a chat room or a bulletin board or a discussion group of people who have the same condition. They've created among, again, that small subgroup of patients, a high level of network effects. And they do it on a national, even an international basis. Two other exceptions, well, I would say, where patients will value, and if you have others, I'd love to hear them. Uh, patients will, have, will value having other patients on the network. One is parents with children. You know, I do value being able to have, if I'm a parent, an ability to see my child's medical record. So that's an exception. And the other one is caregivers, where uh, I do value having other caregivers. In uh, if I'm a, if I'm a if I have my elderly mom, you know, I value having uh, being able to achieve her or just see her medical records. Uh, Kaiser, Group Health Cooperative, a number of the established integrated delivery systems and their personal health records. Uh, Kaiser, Group Health Cooperative have 60% participation. Uh, really, really high. Why? Because there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things you can do with it. A lot of apps. It's not simply a window to your medical record. You can see your lab results. You can schedule your next visit. Uh, a handful of community public health information exchanges, I think, have been extremely successful. Most of them have not. And the last one I'll mention is I would expect private health information exchanges where you've seen the growth in the industry over the last couple of years. Uh, likely in the sense of I don't have the data, but just by the numbers of growth and by the fact that they are very tightly controlled networks where there's pre-existing relationships, I expect that they're going to be very successful. Uh, where are their potentials? Uh, alliances, Commonwealth, uh, and the EHR, HI inter interoperability work group. I want to single those out. They're ultimately going to be successful or not successful on their ability to create network effects. And uh, in the case of Commonwealth, they've got, I think, 20% of the market of EHRs uh, in ambulatory and 20 40% in the ambulatory and 20% in the inpatient side. You know, with 40% of the market, that's a pretty good reach towards the tipping point. And the first application that they're working on, if you're following the details of what they're doing, is around patient identity. Great advantage in standardizing and centralizing that. I expect that they're not going to have a lot of challenges in trying to get people to follow. 
Where it gets more complicated for them is where, uh, in some of the apps that may be competitive among the members of Commonwealth, again, the patient portal example, and if you follow the details of this, all scripts has acquired its own patient portal, a company called Jardogs. So if every member of Commonwealth has its own patient portal, you know, you're reducing dramatically the potential for network effects here. Uh, and there are many others, and I'm a little pressed for time, so I'm not going to have a lot of time to deal with it. Okay, so um, why is there a picture of a puppy here? Uh, I, I want you to ask you to perk up your ears, because the next slide is really, really important. And uh, this is Archie. He is our new corgi puppy. Uh, corgis are born with flat ears, and there is a day, maybe two, in their lives where the, one of their ears will perk up, and then the next day the other ear perks up, and they walk around looking like Yoda for the rest of their lives. So here is one day for Archie, and he's asking you to please perk up your ears. Okay, creating network effects. Very little discussion about this, and we need to understand this far better, because the notion of how you go about doing this the metaphor is one of a rocket launch, where you've got to create enough momentum and force to be able to clear the atmosphere, or you're likely to see your product offering go crashing down to Earth. So I've talked to you about MySpace, uh, talked to you about Facebook quite a bit. MySpace was a competitor, and at one point, back about 2006, they were actually ahead of Facebook in the number of people they had signed up, but they fell behind. And today, I think the company was sold for, or a couple years ago, was sold for about $35 million. They're pretty much off the radar screen. Uh, the action items here, you've got to map the network that you're participating in. Some of you are going to be like a telehealth remote monitoring application, multi-parameter. You probably need to be thinking of yourself both as a platform and as an application, and you're going to fit into many other people's networks. Understand and prioritize and strategize for a successful launch. Uh, the second area I'm going to cover is what I call strategic openness or actually what Professor Joel West of Claremont Keck coined as strategic openness. Uh, openness strategies disrupt industries. Is this you? People recognize this? This is a Wang word processor. And when I started my career back in the early 80s, the, uh, the administrative assistants loved these things. All they did was word processing. They had 10-inch disks. Uh, you couldn't take it and use it in another computer. All you could do with it was word processing. They were $10,000. So what happened? Well, along comes the personal computer. You can buy a word processing program for a couple of hundred bucks. Why do I need a Wang processor? They're out of business. Industries tend to go through three stages. They start closed. The Wang is the best example. A couple folks, one guy in Cleveland invents a word processing program. Someone else halfway around the world invents a word processing program. There's no reason you would expect any kind of compatibility among those programs. The second stage is forced or involuntary openness. Now everyone's got a word processing program, but half the world's on WordPerfect and half the world is on Word. And the companies are forced by customers. They might be forced by government policy. That's certainly driving health information technology right now. They may be forced by companies that break from the pack. There's many other reasons why this may happen. And then what we get to is uh, where openness can be used for competitive advantage. And uh, let's continue with the word processing example in the last 10 years. So Google comes along, and they offer Google uh, Docs and a spreadsheet, and they offer it for free. 
You know, the business model changes as companies start. Now, free is not the only way to go about this. Uh, let me offer the, the last substantive point I'm going to go through here is an example. And then I'll show you a long list. All I can really do is analogize to other industries where this is being used. And it is uh, very much a strategy. Even companies like Facebook and uh, Apple, which are largely closed, have open APIs. So the example is an accountable care organization or an integrated delivery system. The problem they've got is patient leakage or patients going outside of the network. And here's the thought process that I predict will happen. This is looking forward. This is not yet today. So the ACO or the delivery system recognizes, hey, our, ne our patient network is leaky. 30 to 45 percent plus of our patients go outside to outside providers. They don't go to our providers. And there have been about eight or ten uh, really well-documented studies that show this is a consistent pattern across large integrated delivery systems. We, we don't have really good data on this because the data that you need is in your competitor's computer. But with all-payer databases, with health information exchanges, uh, this is going to be the pattern that ACOs are going to have to deal with. And the smaller the ACO, the larger the leakage. Uh, so what you recognize is we're flying blind. 30 to 45 percent of our patients go outside of the network. We have no idea what happens to them. And are they being cared for well? Do we get information back on them? Uh, we need a strategy. We need a plan. How do we deal with those patients that are going outside of our network? Uh, I predict many organizations, particularly large integrated delivery systems, are going to default to the old closed. We're going to try and do everything that we can to keep patients within our network, and we won't share a lot of data unless we're absolutely forced to do it. And at the other side, if you've got 30 percent or 45 percent of your patients uh, going outside of your network, at some point you have an aha moment and you recognize that if 45 percent of your patients are being cared for by somebody outside of your network, uh, we better know what's going on with them because we're at economic risk. My bottom line depends upon somebody else outside of my network doing a good job caring for those patients. So uh, I want to now share data with them, and I want to get data back. And I think I will predict even further that it's going to go one step further. It's not only going to be, I want to share data with you, but it's going to be, here, you've got my patient. Take our data. Make sure you use it properly. Uh, and keep on top of what's going on with this patient. Many other use cases around strategic openness. Uh, and I'm being asked to wrap up, so I'm going to do that. Okay, this is my uh, this is the closing the closing slide, and let me let me ad address this from a couple of different levels. Uh, the slide represents uh, how, how many of you could how many of you recognize where this scene is from? No one. Wow. Okay, this is from the London Olympics in 2012. And uh, at one point, Tim Berners-Lee was introduced. He is the inventor of the World Wide Web. And he tweeted, and it was shown on the, the, the LED lights on the seats, uh, speaking of the World Wide Web, this is for everyone. You know, this is the spirit and, and the promise of the connection economy. The headline here is headline is becoming the ultimate connection platform. Uh, so think of what we're trying to accomplish with some of the other large platforms outside of healthcare. eBay, Amazon, many others, they're essentially transactions. You're buying stuff. And yes, they add value because they collect information about you, but it's still a one-off exchange. Healthcare is way more complex. 
where the value proposition really becomes dependent upon having longitudinal data. If you are a chronic patient and your lab data is in one platform and everything else is in another platform, we can't achieve care coordination. If you're an emergency room patient and the ER that you show up with is on a different platform that can't exchange information with wherever your medical records are, you know, it's all for naught. So my prediction is we're going to have very highly interoperable platforms, at least at the level of exchanging data, and that ultimately what we've seen in terms of creativity and business models in outside of healthcare is going to be eclipsed by the kinds of uh, potential value that is going to be created by the platforms that are going to be developed in healthcare. Uh, let me close with speaking from the heart. Uh, the people in this room, you, uh, I would expect most of you are going to be uh, disruptors with new types of technologies. Uh, I, as I said, have been around healthcare for 30 years and have never uh, sensed a more opportune time. Uh, so uh, I, I hope that these new rules that I have shared with you will give you the opportunity and some inspiration to see ways that you can uh, take some of your offerings, understand what's happening, what's going to be happening in the healthcare system, uh, go forth and disrupt, go forth and improve patient care. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll take one or two questions. Ken. In reality, patients are the ones that ultimately deliver, carry out their own care in the end. Yeah. So I'm making an observation. I'm in no way against connecting patients. Uh, the question that I'm asking is, uh, really, do you, do you as a patient value having other patients on your network? Are you going to communicate with them a lot? And my observation is, uh, unless you've got an unusual medical condition or you're a parent, that's probably not where the strongest networks are going to come from. It's not meant to be a value judgment. It's meant to be an observation. And if people can prove me wrong and create new value propositions where patients really do want to communicate, more power to you. Does that answer your question, Ken? That's fine. That's okay. Don't have to agree with me. It's the question that I think is more important. One more. I'm going to ask a potentially disruptive question. Please do. Okay. Is the problem really uh, the lack of uh, real uh, effective networks, or is uh, the problem the lack of uh, networks of synapses in the brains of uh, politicians who cannot seem to uh, provide the necessary political infrastructure for creating a more integrated system. If uh, the two parties cannot agree on something, you've already destroyed the network of two, which is the first uh, network that you need. So to me, at least it seems that uh, that is really the fundamental problem here, uh, and, and not whether we have uh, net uh, connectivity or interesting platforms, because they'll make very little difference in the long run. Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 have, I certainly have to acknowledge your point, and, and to date what we've seen is really much more lack of network effects in healthcare. And, and there's multiple, multiple reasons, you know, which I haven't had the time to get into. Uh, and your debate is kind of a philosophical one. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's an argument for a single-payer system like the rest of the world. Um, I'm personally a believer in the free market. And uh, I think companies can compete and that, you know, if, if and I, I actually like the government's thinking around high-tech of, 
you know, what we want to do is, you know, get the market working and then get out of the way. So, you know, we can have a, maybe we, you want to have a complex, more philosophical discussion over a beer. I, I don't disagree with your points. This could be a lot easier if we could have the two political parties working closer together to make this happen. Uh, nonetheless, it's so powerful. And I would say, and I'll, I'll, discuss, I'll be discussing this in my blog over the coming months and in the book. The question is, is this all a nice to have or a must have? And I'm going to make the argument it's a must have. If we're really going to coordinate care, we're going to need these kind of networks. It cannot happen outside and we'll never be able to achieve the value proposition of care coordination. Uh, with that, I'm going to end my uh, presentation. And I'm putting on a different hat. I'm putting on the facilitator, not the, not the uh, speaker hat, but the uh, conference chair. And I'm going to introduce our next two speakers, Leslie Kelly Hall and uh, Ligia Ricciardi. Uh, I am, I, again, I want to thank both of you, Leslie, Ligia. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thanks. And always an honor to be here. This is my 10th year here. Uh, like, I'm not joking here when I say this. These two women are creating the epicenter, the ground zero of patient-centered disruptive innovation in America. From a policy angle, from Ligia working with the, the federal government, and with Leslie uh, working as a tireless advocate, I've known Leslie. We've sat in the same management uh, management room uh, for a number of years at a regional health system. Uh, I go back a, a long way with both Leslie and Ligia. I'm honored to introduce them, thank them for coming, and look forward to your insights and, and commentary. So.